Hi everybody, Professor Gassimi here, and in this component of our lecture, we're going to be speaking about CSS layout. I do encourage you to take a look, especially for this section, at some of the recommended readings. This component of the lecture will be speaking about how you use CSS to make the layout and uh, beautiful structuring of content in grids and other such things pain-free and easy so that you can focus on the content. Some of the intuitions here will be better grasped if you play around with the content a little bit through the interactive components that are listed in those links. So first let's speak about normal flow and what is normal flow in the context of web development. Normal flow is just how content appears when you don't do anything else, when you don't specify anything, it's the default behavior of the browser. So for example, if I had some HTML that you see here on the left, I love my cat, an unstructured list followed by some list items and then an ending paragraph, and I had no CSS, I would still get something like you see on the right-hand side from a display perspective in my browser. Now, I may not like that, for example, my browser decides that list items are to be displayed as blocks, meaning that there is some white space, they're put on separate lines, and so on and so forth. I may want to change that and say that I actually want them to be displayed in line. Okay, you can control that using the display property in CSS that I'm showing here in the middle. And indeed, if you were to do that without changing anything in your HTML, you can see that on the display side, the items that were that were part of the list items here are sort of all put together on one line because I've moved them from uh, display block to display inline through this specification. Display block is what makes content appear as distinct blocks. This is a concept we sort of discussed as early as the start of our HTML lectures but have touched on as well throughout the course of the CSS lectures. Just to make this concrete, what we could do here is we could come into CSS and we could say, for example, that we want um, the bold, bolded items to be displayed as a block. And what that would do is for that same HTML as we had before, it would come here and it would take this bolded word love and it would it treat it like a block. So it would add a new line, add some space, add another new line, add some space and continue on with the content. Okay. Now beyond inline and block, there are a couple of other display properties that I think are very powerful and I would like to, to take you through some of these properties because I think they're going to be useful as you're doing your CSS development. The first one is display flexbox and this makes it pretty easy to lay out content in one dimension as a row or as a column. So for example, if we had this very simple HTML that you see on the left, one, two, three. We had some CSS in the middle, one CSS class to govern the wrapper. That's this class for the top div. And then some other CSS to govern the boxes that are contained within the wrapper. Um, what you could do is if the wrapper has a display flex and as well as a flex direction of column, it will take the content here and it will display it nice and neatly and beautifully as uh, one column of information, just like you see here. And if you wanted to switch from viewing this as from a column to a row, it's as simple as changing that flex direction again from a column to a row, as you can see when I pan back and forth between these. So the flex is sort of nice if you need to lay out just one uh, row or one column of things. Now, children of a display flex element can use the flex property to further control this layout. So, for example, if you set flex to um, any given number, let's say one, then it's going to cause all of the elements there to uniformly grow and fill the container. What I've done here, just for the sake of making this easy to read, is I've kept the CSS the same. I've come to the HTML and I've added some inline style. So note what I did here is the first box, I made the flex one. Okay, 
Second box, I made the flex one. Third box, I made the flex one. And now what you can see is that these three boxes uh, in the row are about the same size, right? But I can also edit them. I can come here and change the flex in the first box to eight, the flex in the second box to one, and the flex in the third box to one. And now eight tenths, right? Eight plus one plus one is 10. And eight out of the 10 for the flex is a belonging to the first box, the one that contains the word one. And so eight tenths of this uh, row is now occupied by this one box compared to the other two. So this flex property, which you get access to when you're nested within a flex display wrapper, is, is really nice. It allows you to pretty trivially and easily scale content. Now, the flex property actually allows you to specify more than just one value. Uh, if you provide more than one value, for example, two, flex will interpret the first as the flex grow and the second as the flex basis, meaning that there is a uh, maximum size, if you will, and a minimum size that the flex will take. If you were to, for example, resize your browser window, your viewing window, um, the eight one, it would scale to look like this in the in the largest instantiation, and it would it would scale to look like the bottom display in the smallest instantiation. In addition to display flex, there's also something called display grid. Okay, and I actually think that display grid is even better than flex box or display flex because. Um, Flex is sort of just a subset of what the grid can accomplish, as you'll see in a minute here. So let's come back to our CSS here. And I've kept most of this the same. Uh, well, not mostly. I've kept some of it the same. So, let, But let's step through it. Right now, I changed the wrapper's display to be grid. And what I did was I specified two additional properties here. I have a grid template column that says, um, there's three numbers, one for each of actually the columns I want to have in my ultimate display. So you can see there's one, two, three. And in the display, there's ultimately one, two, three. And then I have grid template rows, and I specify two numbers. In this case, it's pixels, and I have one, two of them. I also have some information on the gap that I want to appear between the content right here. Okay, and then just as before, I have some properties for the box that styles it, adds padding, adds margin, and so on and so forth. Well, this is, this is really nice, right? Because I can come here, and insofar as I have the number of uh, elements to fill up the grid that I've specified here, it gets laid out exactly as I had said with no additional kind of work on my part. It's just with a couple of lines of CSS, I can lay out a beautiful... Uh, well-structured grid that's easy to look at and so on. Now, I also wanted to note here that the units you have available within the grid template column property and the grid template row property allows you to control things about the size of this grid. So for example, I changed this to be four frame, one frame, four frame, two frame, one frame, which basically says I want two columns, which you can see now I have two columns, and I want three rows. I have three rows, but then I want the First uh, row, first column, that's what's specified by these two numbers, and that's this biggest one here. Okay, I want this to be 4-4. Four, four. I want the um, first row, second column to be 4-2, that's this one, and so on and so forth. So using this specification, you can dynamically size the grid as well as um, uh, the total number of items that are available within the grid. Lastly, what I think is really nice about this display grid is that content can be assigned to individual positions in the grid using the grid row and column properties. So for example, what I've come here and done to my HTML is in addition to keeping the class box and everything, I've added an additional class TR and BL, standing for top right and bottom left respectively, um, to these two elements, the, the one and the four containing divs. And what I've done here is, as you can see for the dot BL, which has to do with uh, governing the div that has 
uh, the class equal to BL over here. I've told it that I want this content to fall into grid row 3, column 1, and I want the background to be red. And even though it's it wouldn't naturally be ordered that way, I'm able to sort of force that to the position I want it to be in the grid. And I can do the same for uh, the top right one as well, or .tr, by telling the grid row to be 1, grid column to be 3, and setting the background to teal. So I think that this display grid is the fastest, easiest, most straightforward way to get content that's really beautifully laid out on your web page without having to do a lot of um, kind of crazy CSS work to get started. So moving on, within the display property, there's also um, something called float. And what this does is it a floated element is basically independent of the normal flow. So the, the content floats around that element because you've sort of made it sit independently. As an example, if we have the HTML that you're seeing here on the left with an H1, a div, and a P, and let's say that the div is a, a box, has the word float in it. Um, that's this box here. You can see that it sort of floats to, it, it's independent really of what, what you see on the rest of the screen here. You can change, by the way, when you're setting the float property, you can change it to be right or to be left, depending on which orientation you want the content to float in. So we've talked a, a little bit about the display. I'd like to now switch gears and speak about the position property. So what position does um, is governs where your content resides within the page. And in normal flow, everything is sort of positioned relative to the order in which you write it. So if you have one paragraph that follows another, it will show up on the right-hand side that way. When you set position to static, this is just the default that every element gets. It means, you know, put this element into the normal position in the document layout flow, okay? And so, for example, if we had some HTML where we had a couple of divs, in each of those divs we had some paragraphs and we had nicely styled them so that they looked like, I don't know, multiple choice questions, we could um, choose one of those, let's call it, with class position, set the position to static, and, and nothing is going to change, right? It just stays where it is. All we've done is change the color. But if we were to change that position to relative instead of static, again, from relative, from, from static to relative, um, it will no longer keep it in its normal flow position, but will actually reposition that element um, relative to its original location. So in this case, we said we want to position this starting from where it was. We want to, and from the top, move 30 pixels. So kind of push it down 30 pixels. And from the left, push it 30 pixels. OK, so we jut it out consequently to the uh, bottom right. OK, this allows you to modify an element's position on the page, moving it relative to the position in normal flow. You can also set the position to absolute, like I'm showing you here. And what this effectively does is it moves an element completely out of the page's normal layout flow. So it's as though you sort of grabbed that element and made it float on top of everything else as though it was not part of any of the other structural pieces. It can overlap things um, as though it's completely independent. What I'm doing here is in addition to showing the position absolute, you can see I've I come from the left and I've applied a 100 pixel offset. So I've pushed this uh, from the left, you know, 100 pixels. You can also use something called position fixed, which is sort of, um, it's a nice way to control what is visible independent of where you're scrolling on a page. I've got an example of exactly what position fix does there on the right-hand side. Effectively, it makes it so that that floating item that has positioned fixed, no matter where you look, it's always going to be there. Usually, it's used for things like nav bars, sometimes footers. It just depends on the web design. Um, 
This one I think is pretty interesting. It's position sticky, which basically says that the display element is going to be in its normal position until the top of the screen hits it. And at that point, it's going to get stuck to the top of the view window. So you can see as I scroll up uh, and I sort of the top of my that box containing box hits two, it sort of drags two down with it. So two gets stuck. It can't move move past sort of this area. Okay, that's what the sticky one does. What I really want you to conclude from this is that normal flow is how the browser lays out HTML pages by default, and that you can use the display and the position properties of CSS to control how your web page is laid out.